We're recording to the cloud, and I'll get the live stream started on Facebook. Started. Um, and I need to make sure I'm sharing it on PyStarter. I have accidentally shared it on my own timeline before, um, which actually worked out kind of well. My friends and family really enjoyed the event. That being said, this is for PsyStarter's audience. Okay, go live. Great. And we are being live streamed. Awesome. And hey, everybody, thanks for coming. We're going to get started in just one minute. I'm going to go ahead and get my screen shared together. Um, so let's get this PowerPoint started. We're so excited you're here. We're so excited to be hosting Autumn. Okay, perfect. I'll share my screen. Screen share is loading. Perfect. It is loaded. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Caroline Nickerson. I'm from the SciStarter team. I'm really delighted to be joining you today for an online Citizen Science Month event. Uh, this program was made possible due to the support of the National Library of Medicine, the Network of the National Library of Medicine, and the All of Us Research Program. They're the ones who supported us to get the closed captioners you're enjoying on Zoom in English and Spanish, as well as the interpretation into Spanish. Um, so if you're watching live on Facebook right now, it's not too late to come join us on Zoom. You can find the event on our website um, on citizensciencemonth.org so you can enjoy the closed captions and interpretation. That being said, if you are watching on Facebook, don't be shy. Put your thoughts, your feelings, your questions in the comments. We'll be monitoring that live stream as well and posing your questions to our special guest today, Autumn Gertz from Outbreaks Near Me. Uh, that being said, before Autumn introduces herself and talks a little bit about the Outbreaks Near Me Citizen Science Project, we're just going to briefly go over what's going on with Citizen Science Month. So yes, like I said, my name is Caroline. I am an advisor at SciStarter, but first and foremost, I'm a citizen science enthusiast. So you might be wondering, what is citizen science? It goes by a few different names. At SciStarter, we'll, we'll work with people who call it citizen science, community science, neighborhood science, public participation in scientific research. As long as people are doing real science, we want to work with them. Ultimately, citizen science, how we think of it at SciStarter, is as a collaboration between scientists and those of us who are curious, concerned, and motivated to make a difference. Or another way to say it is citizen science allows anybody and everybody to turn their curiosity about the world into real scientific impact. Most often, you're collecting or analyzing data for citizen science researchers. So data is just information. Data can be words or pictures that you take of your community to document climate change. Data could be, uh, you know, numerical measurements like temperature or inches of rainfall. It's, data is just information that we analyze to understand something new about the world. We look at that data and we try to draw some conclusions from it. And at SciStarter, people add citizen science projects because they need your help. Uh, scientists don't have enough eyes, ears, and perspectives to know everything there is to know, to understand everything that needs to be understood, to answer every question that needs to be answered. So that's where SciStarter comes in. We connect scientists to the volunteer communities they need, and we connect curious people like the ones tuning in right now to projects that need their help where they can make a difference and help create scientific knowledge of, about the world um, to answer questions that we all really want answered. There are over 2,000 projects, events, and tools that people have added to SciStarter for you to discover. And most often, you find a project on SciStarter you, you know, you, you find their profile, then you click on that participate button and you go somewhere else to participate, like the Outbreaks Near we, Me website. And for some projects that are SciStarter affiliates, like Outbreaks Near Me, you're able to track the number and frequency of your contributions in your SciStarter dashboard. That's great for bragging rights. If you're in high school, that's great to keep track of your service if you want to report community service. Uh, but if you just want to show off to your friends and family, no matter what age you are, that you've done something good for the world, you can keep track of all your, uh, the number and frequency of your affiliate pro um, contributions in your SciStarter dashboard. So Citizen Science Month is what we're in right now. It runs all through April. Um, you can participate in Citizen Science any day of the year. That being said, April is really our excuse to celebrate. It can um, consist of programs, projects, events, and materials that help people host events like this one are in person at their local library. I'll actually be at the Sacramento Public Library tomorrow. Um, 
are, you know, if you want to just have a meetup with your friends and family or you want to post on social media about how excited you are about citizen science, we have all those materials on citizenscienceMonth.org. We even have bookmarks that feature outbreaks near me. I really love those bookmarks. Um, Citizen Science Month wouldn't be possible without the support of Arizona State University, as well as the Network of the National Library of Medicine and the All of Us Research Program. And because All of Us is helping us, you know, put on Citizen Science Month, before we get to our featured project for today, which is Outbreaks Near Me, we have a quick video about All of Us. Surely we should be able to improve the future of healthcare, not just for Ray and Kim or even you, but for all of us. Sign up at joinallofus.org. The future of health begins with you. Meet Ray. Rick. Oh, sorry about that. I hope the sound came through for that. If it didn't, you can watch it on our YouTube channel at um, our SciStarter. Uh, it's on our Facebook page. It's all over the place. But anyway, citizenscienceMonth.org is where you go to find all the awesome citizen science that you want and need. Um, and it's where you can help scientists answer questions they can't answer without you. Uh, there's a whole events calendar here as well as events about all of us. So you can find that there. Um, Stall catchers, uh, Eterna, Narika, these are all featured projects for Citizen Science Month. But for today's event, we're celebrating Outbreaks Near Me, one of my favorite projects, a really awesome project. Autumn's going to tell you all about it, how you can participate. You can find instructions for it at that scistarter.org forward slash NLM page. But I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing here and yield the floor to Autumn. Autumn, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. All right, I'm going to share my screen. that a second. All right, are the slides coming through? Yep, they look good. Great. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, today, I'll be talking about Outbreaks Near Me. So I'm Autumn Gertz. I am a project manager with the Computational Epidemiology Lab at Boston Children's Hospital, the group that developed and hosted um, and currently hosts Outbreaks Near Me. I have a Master's of Science in Epidemiology from Boston University, a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology and Public Health Science from UMass Amherst. Uh, and my sort of areas of interest and expertise and experience are really within public health surveillance, infectious disease epidemiology, and public health research. Uh, within the Computational Epidemiology Lab at Boston Children's, I manage Outbreaks Near Me, which is why 
I'm here today talking to you all. Um, and what that entails is really managing the tool itself as well as uh, projects and um, research efforts that come out of the tool. So firstly, what is participatory surveillance? Um, this is also known as crowdsource surveillance. Um, and, and what that is, you might hear me use both terms uh, during the chat today. And what that is, is it's voluntary reporting from the general public that provides data to visualize and track current and potential hotspots of disease. Uh, there was just a bunch of examples of different types of citizen science projects. So ours specifically uses voluntary reporting to track disease, but there are other things that can be tracked through participatory systems as well. And why is participatory surveillance important? Early detection and early response are key to preventing the spread of any disease. Self-reporting symptoms in real time can complement traditional tracking while providing useful information directly to the public. So we're able to supplement sort of your more traditional measures of disease, which I'll get into a little bit more detail. Um, but something about our site that we think is really great is that our volunteers get data back. So they're able to see who's sick around them, uh, and, and sort of the national level, what's happening down to their zip code, what's happening to learn uh, that they should be changing any of their behaviors or just aware of any diseases going around. And lastly, traditional surveillance generally does not detect instances of disease that do not involve an encounter with a healthcare entity. So I think a lot of us have had an illness that while we didn't feel great, it didn't feel severe enough that we needed to seek our doctor. Uh, which is very common and good that the disease is mild, but that means that those cases are not detected by traditional surveillance. And then we might be undercounting um, what's actually going on in the disease landscape. And then that might inform precautionary measures or different guidances. If, if we're not aware of the actual rates of disease, we can't um, best prepare. So there is international crowdsource surveillance platforms across the globe. Uh, I'm highlighting just a few here. Uh, that we work closely with on our team. This includes uh, flu tracking in Australia and New Zealand, as well as influenza net in Western Europe. And then you can see outbreaks near me. Um, here we have the US and Canada as we have reporting for both those countries. We also have reporting for Mexico, uh, but some of our features are not enabled in Mexico right now uh, due to differing regulations on the national level. So you can see it's sort of all around uh, the world, and, and we work closely with these groups to improve respiratory disease surveillance, um, especially in the past few years. A lot of these sites were developed for flu surveillance specifically and then pivoted to capturing COVID. Uh, so we navigated to challenges uh, of that um, collectively. And if you want to see sort of all of these sites in one spot, you can go to Global Flu View. There's a URL. I'm located here. This is hosted by Ending Pandemics, uh, which is a group we work very closely with. And this takes the data from outbreaks near me. You can see in the US from influenza net, not much going on in Europe when I took the screenshot, as well as Australia and then other countries like Thailand um, that have citizen science and participatory surveillance systems. So you can change time, change the view, but sort of see all of these international participatory surveillance systems for respiratory disease on one uh, map and visualization. So specifically about outbreaks near me, it's a crowdsourced syndromic surveillance system for respiratory disease. Uh, we're primarily focused on flu and COVID-19 currently. Though when I get into the data a little bit more, um, I'll describe some other symptoms we collect as well. And then the data captured helps support disease surveillance, as mentioned, and this includes symptom data, healthcare utilization, testing, and vaccination. Um, I pulled this number earlier this afternoon. So we've had over 7.2 million unique data points entered into outbreaks near me since March of 2020. Uh, so it's a really robust data set when you're looking at it, and we get some really great reporting. And I think what's in uh, really good about Outbreaks Near Me and really exciting about the project is, is novel surveillance systems like Outbreaks Near Me complement existing surveillance by providing real-time estimates and detecting non-care-seeking cases that might be missed by traditional public health surveillance. Uh, I'll give examples of both of those from our data in a little bit, but presented here is a disease burden uh, pyramid that was actually modeled for flu. And you can see sort of the widest, making up the biggest portion of the pyramid at the bottom is infected and asymptomatic. 
and then symptomatic self-care. So those individuals who are sick, but it doesn't feel severe enough to go seek care. Um, everyone under that line is not detected in traditional surveillance for the most part. And that's the majority of individuals who are sick. Uh, and that's where we're able to come in and complement existing surveillance as existing surveillance or traditional surveillance methods really capture the top part of this pyramid, the medically attended, hospitalized, and death cases of illness. So a little history about outbreaks near me. Uh, some of you might be familiar with flu near you. Uh, this was our first crowdsourced surveillance system for flu that was launched in 2011. It's actually launched with the movie Contagion as like promotional material, but also a citizen science project um, to go along with that movie. And then we leveraged the technology of Flu Near You in March of 2020 to launch COVID Near You as a sister site, uh, which was doing crowdsource surveillance specifically for COVID-19. We realized pretty quickly maintaining two sites that were capturing very similar data um, just for different syndromes and diseases wasn't the most efficient. Uh, so in December of 2020, we launched Outbreaks Near Me, which was crowdsourced surveillance for flu and COVID-19. And we really used the technology from Flu Near You and its history, its data, and its rich um, reporting population, and then combine that with the newer technology of COVID Near You to have the Outbreaks Near Me um, that we see today. So how does it work? Individuals can sign up to get weekly reminders via email or text um, directly on the site as well as you can sign up uh, through Size Starter and have it located in your dashboard there. Um, individuals report if they feel healthy or sick. Uh, they can also report on household member health. So this can include partners, spouses, roommates, siblings, children, parents, grandparents, anyone who's living in your household who you are privy to their health, how they're feeling, and also have their permission um, to report on their health you're able to, which really helps us uh, get some really great data, especially for our younger and older populations. If we're just recruiting one person from a household and then we get data on five people, uh, that really enriches the data set. Uh, sick participants report symptoms, any care seeking or diagnoses, and then all our participants report if they've been tested for COVID, their influenza and COVID-19 vaccination status, and then gender, age, race, Hispanic status, and zip or postal code. And looking at our little computer here on the screen, um, this is one example of a view of visualization you can see on Outbreaks Near Me. So I mentioned that our participants get data back to them as well. Uh, so you can see these pink dots show COVID symptoms. There's orange dots in here that show flu symptoms. You can toggle on other symptoms, which is purple, individuals who report not feeling well, but it doesn't really classify as flu or COVID. And then our most popular response, which is no symptoms, you can put that on. Um, there's also another layer on the map. The back, there's a grayscale you can enable that shows the sort of traditional surveillance or official case count data uh, for the area. So for flu, it's at the state level. For COVID, it's at the county level. Um, so you can see sort of how the self-reported data compares in your area to the official data that's being reported at that time. So our healthy survey, um, healthy data is really important. I think a lot of people know they should report in when they don't feel well, uh, but they don't understand as much why reporting when they feel healthy is important. And this allows us to calculate relative measures in our population, such as rates and proportions of illness. It also helps keep our users engaged. You know, most of the time, hopefully people are feeling well. So making sure they're still reporting so that when they don't feel well, we are able to capture that. On average, just over 85% of our weekly reports are healthy reports, so it's the majority of our population, um, which really shows that it, it's just as important as reporting when one feels sick. If someone does not have an account with us, they do have to enter their demographics each time, so this is now month and year of birth, gender, zip code, Hispanic status, and race. Uh, if you got your flu vaccine, this updates every year, so on the current site, it's on or after July 1st, 2022. And then we refresh that every July. Uh, we have two COVID-19 vaccine questions currently asking about primary series and then booster doses. And then we ask individuals a bonus question of if they've been tested for COVID in the past 30 days. Uh, we ask the type of test and why they got tested and the results. And this really came about um, 
especially with home testing, when it came out, asymptomatic home testing is something it was very hard to get data on uh, that we were able to capture. And then our unhealthy survey. So what do people contribute when they aren't feeling well? Uh, for symptoms, there's a variety I'll get into on the next slide a little bit, but you select your symptoms. When you started feeling ill, if you sought care, how long, any testing, any diagnoses, any treatment. And this data supports infectious disease surveillance efforts for public health agencies, including CDC and state and local health departments. And this data also supports research efforts to understand disease activities and patterns. So what is the data we collect um, really for these surveillance work uh, and the research? So symptoms, as I mentioned, we primarily track respiratory illnesses, uh, COVID-19 and flu, but we also have whole body symptoms, digestive symptoms, other. Um, so this allows us one, if there's a new, for example, COVID variant that comes out that has changing symptomology, this allows us to track that. But two, it allows us if any new or emerging issues come about, it might not be a respiratory disease. Uh, last spring and summer, we were looking at rates of rash being reported when MPOX was coming out, uh, things like that. So while we're focused on respiratory illness, we do try to collect sort of systemic uh, symptomologies. And then moving on to care seeking, we ask when they started feeling ill, the type of care testing, which includes that they didn't seek care, uh, and how long after they started feeling ill did they seek care so we can get a sense of how long are people sick, potentially contagious or other things before they decide it's time to seek care. And then for testing and treatment, what type of medical test did you receive, if any? We've added at-home testing in that. Um, if you received a diagnosis, what was it? We've actually added RSV uh, since this slide was put together. And then if you got a prescription, what type of prescription did you get? So who uses these data? I keep saying research and public health surveillance, but who's really using it and how are they using it? Uh, on the research side, it's used for surveillance, research surveillance. So things like estimating COVID-19 incidents and hospitalizations, web and phone-based COVID-19 syndromic surveillance in Canada. Uh, we've done a lot of work with care seeking and testing. Uh, we had a lot of work last flu season looking at at-home testing. Uh, use in the United States, uptake, and then continued use. We also looked at delayed medical care and underlying health during the pandemic. And then a lot of different other topics, including the association between mask wearing and lower COVID-19 risk. On the public health side, we work with federal, state, and local public health agencies to help supplement and complement their data uh, for respiratory illnesses. On the federal level, we work very closely with some folks at CDC. State level examples are the California Department of Public Health, Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Uh, we've worked with Virginia, Minnesota, Florida, a bunch of others as well. And then local, we work very closely with the city of Boston. And we also have a very good collaboration in the King County, Washington area, uh, the greater, greater Seattle um, area. And what do we actually support? Surveillance and public health efforts, a lot of flu burden estimation, going back to that pyramid where we see most people are either asymptomatic or caring at home. Uh, so helping state and federal and local health departments assess how much flu is actually circulating and then estimating COVID-19, including home tests. So what cases are we missing in our surveillance, official surveillance, traditional surveillance um, with at-home testing of COVID-19? So who is reporting into outbreaks near me? So we do have a sort of two groups uh, that report in, our registered users. These are individuals that have signed up for reminders, have created an account. Um, we do get sort of the most data capture from them, but that's also because they get their weekly reminders um, to report in. These individuals, their demographic information is saved, so they have quicker reporting. And these are also the folks that are able to report on household member health. We also have guest users, individuals who wanna come in, report the minima, minimum necessary data, excuse me, and they report as they want to. Um, we have seen sort of with peaks in, in illness, both in COVID and flu over the years, we do get an increase of guest users when there's a lot of disease circulating, people aren't feeling well, they want to report that, but they don't necessarily sign up to report when they're feeling healthy as well. Um, since we have pivoted from flu near you and COVID near you to outbreaks near me, our numbers have been 
increasing, which is good to see, um, but we do want to bring over all those users that we had in our previous systems. So in 2021, we did an assessment and found that over 80% of our users had contributed to flu near you. So it was a pretty good carry over of our flu near you users. And then in 2022, we actually saw this go down to 70% of our outbreaks near me users had contributed to flu near you, but this was positive uh, because our overall numbers and outbreaks near me went up from 2021 to 2022. So that meant we were getting new users uh, to the system who had never used flu near you rather than losing our flu near you participants. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic presented a situation where people were more aware and invested in disease surveillance and disease tracking. And we were able to leverage that to get a lot of new individuals and, and people who generally weren't as focused on either citizen science or on disease surveillance specifically to get engaged with a platform like ours. But we're always trying to get more participants. The more people we have, the better our data is, uh, especially when you get down to your location. If there's 500 people reporting in your zip code, your data is going to be a lot more rich than if there's three people. Um, with that said, we, we want our data to better represent what's occurring in the US and as a whole. And for that to happen, the individuals reporting in need to reflect what the US looks like as a whole. I think a lot of citizen science projects um, attract certain groups of people, people really interested in science, really engaged, really passionate, uh, which I am, which I'm sure all of you are, which is wonderful. Um, and we're always thrilled with any new volunteers, especially ones that are engaged are gonna keep coming back. But if you think about sort of who is in your networks, in your circles, in your life, who might be interested in participating in something like this, we are looking for more individuals who are younger, male, live in rural areas, as well as expanding our racial and ethnic diversity of the reporting population. So we encourage you all listening today, um, either to visit the site directly, which I'll give instructions on, or sign up uh, via the SciStarter dashboard. Um, but really, any new participants are so welcome. We love to see our numbers go up and more data come in. Um, but we do want our data to, to better reflect what's happening in the US overall. So what have we found from this data? So looking at sort of our traditional disease surveillance and tracking, uh, if we look at this graph here on the left, this is actually from flu near you. We're looking at the rates of influenza-like illness during the flu season for the 2016 through 2019 flu seasons as our baselines for what we're seeing. Uh, starting out in the flu season, a little over 2%, going up to almost six, and then coming down to two. And then this line here is the 2019-2020 season uh, with COVID emerging in the middle of this season. And you can see this decline starts in February and then a sharp decline in March, leveling out in May. And then in our 2020-2021 season, we really didn't detect a lot of influenza-like illness, uh, which aligns with what was found in a lot of other systems, both crowdsourced and uh, traditional surveillance that flu really wasn't circulating in the 2020-2021 season. Uh, looking at sort of how real-time data can be helpful, you'll see here we start to see a drop in February of 2020. I'm sure we're all very familiar that it was really March of 2020 when individuals started um, taking precautions for COVID-19, whether it was coming from the government down or in their own lives. Our population was likely early adopters and uptakers of non-pharmaceutical intervention, so masking, social distancing, hand hygiene, things like that, uh, which might account for the drop early, um, but we're really seeing that drop in our data earlier than other systems started to see it drop in flu uh, with the emergence of COVID-19. And then in the following season, we're really not seeing any at all. Um, it is important to note our population is generally very highly vaccinated for influenza. We usually see over 80% of our population getting a seasonal flu vaccine, which is higher than the US population, which is usually closer to 50%. Um, so important to know when we talk about rates of influenza-like illness. And then looking over here at the right, this is the 2021-2022 flu season. Uh, so this is the whole flu season, looking at our longitudinal rates of respiratory syndromes. We have two different COVID-like illness definitions and then an influenza-like illness. Um, you can see here, this was our Omicron wave. And you 
see, we started seeing um, some, some peaks happening uh, a little ahead of Thanksgiving. This dip here is Thanksgiving of 2021. We generally see a decrease in reporting around the holidays. Um, you can see that this is sort of earlier than if you remember when Omicron really started circulating and us hearing about it. Uh, we, we did pick this up um, a bit earlier than other sim systems, which is why syndromic surveillance as well as participatory really enables that real-time capture of data. And then you can see after Omicron, sort of through the end of flu season in the summer, we had very high rates of respiratory syndromes going around. Um, there was a lot of seasonal allergies, breakthrough infections, um, some of the starts, not on this graph, but in general in our data of the RSV and flu and COVID triple demic. So, um, Due to high vaccination rates, sometimes we weren't capturing the magnitude of cases that were observed in traditional surveillance, but we still got the overall trend. And then we're detecting some other things that uh, were not being detected in uh, COVID-19 and flu surveillance. And then beyond traditional disease surveillance, or what are the research inf insights we're able to get from outbreaks near me? Um, looking at the left, this is comparing a few weeks in the 2021 to 2022 flu season. This is the proportion of individuals who reported being sick and then seeking care. And it was about one in three individuals who were sick who said they sought care. But in the current flu season, we actually saw this drop down to about one in four individuals saying that they were seeking care when being sick. Um, this did exclude people who tested at home only as their type of care seeking. So we're interested, continuing to monitor this data. Is it home testing that's accounting for this drop? Is it that individuals who might have generally sought care are now testing at home and know what to do? Is it that individuals don't want to go into the doctor's office with other types of illnesses going around? Or do people feel educated and empowered to treat at home? We're not sure, um, but it is interesting to see this drop, especially when uh, we're sort of helping bridge a gap and complementing traditional surveillance to see that in more individuals might be omitted by those systems. And then on the right, we're looking at a survival analysis of individuals um, developing respiratory illness due to their likelihood to wear face masks, um, protective face masks. This was part of our annual user survey. So we email out a survey that asks a little bit more questions about behaviors, and things like that um, once a year. And this was sent out, I believe, in June of 2020. Um, so you can see that individuals who are least likely to wear masks were much likelier to develop a respiratory illness compared to those who uh, were most likely to wear a mask sort of 50 days out, especially um, from when they completed that survey. So here, I just wanna highlight the out outbreaks near me, its results, its data have been featured in a variety of places, including um, public health meetings and organizations like the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, who gives out the guidelines for vaccinations in the U.S., um, as well as a variety of scientific journals and news stories. And the most important question to get to today, um, how do I participate? You can go directly to outbreaksnearme.org create an account with your name or a nickname if you don't want to use your name. We just want to know what to call you um, in our communications, email, and a password. And then you can submit your first health report. If you're interested in reporting how you're feeling but don't want to create an account just yet, you can also submit a report anytime without creating an account. This is what our joined form will look like. But as mentioned at the start of the conversation, you can also go via SciStarter if you want to track your contributions there, if you have other citizen science projects there, you can join Outbreaks Near Me through that dashboard and report that way as well. And I will leave that for any questions. There's my email if anyone wants to reach out. There's also a general email for Outbreaks Near Me that our whole team has access to if you have a broader question. But I think we can turn it over uh, to Q&A. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Autumn. Um, I know I already have a bunch of questions, so I'll get us started. And then people, I, some people are watching on Facebook, so Facebook friends, please put your questions in the comments. And if you're watching on Zoom, we really, really do encourage you to ask questions as well. But my first question is, um, so you you mentioned that the there are people who contribute again and again. What do you think drives those people who keep coming back? Yeah, so we, we ask them because we want to know um, consistently. We see that people want to know when individuals around them are sick, they want to know what's happening around them. Uh, we get a lot of 
individuals who, who join, uh, who are sort of the gatekeepers of health for their households. Uh, they're the ones knowing what's going on, making sure their families are safe and healthy. So they like to know what's going on around them. We also see that people really care about citizen science and disease surveillance and want to help um, contribute to those types of projects and that type of data. That's awesome. Um, and I love how you all have become outbreaks near me that, you know, I used to participate when it was just flu near you. I'm curious, like I know early on in the pandemic, people were often confusing or falsely equating COVID and the flu. Do you see people do that in the app as well? Or have people kind of learned by now, like what different symptoms mean what? Yeah, so one of the great things about them reporting their symptoms is we can then infer if we think it's COVID or flu um, instead of individuals doing so. Uh, I will say we are doing analyses now to try to come up with a more precise definition to separate those two, especially with the data we have from this past flu season where we actually saw flu circulating again. We now have rich enough data that we can try and separate those out uh, syndromically. But collecting the um, testing and diagnosis data really helps because we can see what symptoms were associated with a positive flu test, what symptoms were associated with a positive COVID test, and that helps us on our end. Um, we do sometimes get participants that'll email in and be like, I felt this way. I thought I had COVID, but it's negative, or turns out it was flu. Um, so I do think given how similar those two um, infections can present, uh, there's still sometimes confusion on, on what you might have from a symptom standpoint, uh, but thankfully we're able to do some of the inference for them. I love that. And do people ever get educated by doing outbreaks near me? Like, do they learn to tell the difference? I hope, I, I don't know if they learn to tell the difference in themselves. Um, we do stay away from providing direct medical guidance, um, but we try to provide resourcing. So what to do if you have a positive at-home test? What's the difference between flu and COVID? What are the different types of vaccines? Those types of things. So I think um, our participants sometimes follow their own journeys when they're sick a little differently when they're reporting it to someone uh, than they would otherwise. Or sometimes we get sort of follow-up emails about if there's a household that gets sick and how it's sort of spread through their household and things like that. Awesome. This is good. This is really good. I love what you, the work y'all are doing. This is awesome. We have a question in the Zoom from Elizabeth. She wants to know, should we respond to the reminder emails and out of the country, or will that create an accuracy by not reflecting my correct location? Yeah, so uh, we associate your account with a zip code, or we ask you to submit a zip code when you submit a health report. Um, so if you're somewhere else in the US when you're reporting, you can actually change your zip code um, for that time. Or you know, if it's a one week vacation, maybe you skip that week. Um, but we do sort of wanna know exactly where you are so it doesn't skew the data to national level. It can really give um, sort of what's happening in your local area. Awesome stuff. I love it. Um, and then I'm also curious, so Autumn, I know you've been in a leadership role with these projects for a while. Um, is there anything about this work that has surprised you? A lot. Um, I feel it's really interesting to see the differences in like the population that's interested in this throughout time versus folks that get interested when a lot is going on. And, you know, neither is better than the other. It's just sort of different interests and, and passions. Uh, but like I said, when we see those high rates of guest reporters, when there's a lot of disease going around, it's, it's interesting to see that people seek us out or report to us when they're feeling sick, when they're worried about sickness around them, but don't really uh, think about what's happening around them from a disease perspective um, when there's not sort of a big outbreak. Uh, I think the other thing that's really surprised me is sort of how quickly home testing became a very important part of people's like personal COVID protection and journey. Um, and now has very quickly like gone back down. Uh, I think a lot of people, myself included, like I have a drawer full of expired at home tests that I just have sitting there. Um, but it'll be interesting to see as we head into more of a respiratory season, if home testing for COVID picks back up, if home testing for other respiratory diseases becomes more popular, if certain pharmaceutical companies sort of saw how it worked for COVID and feel like it's worth the investment. 
uh, for flu or other respiratory illnesses. That's really interesting. Um, oh my gosh, we got a bunch of questions in the chat um, related to what you were saying about home self COVID testing. Brent wants to know, with so few people doing home self COVID testing and of those testing positive, so few of these positive COVID self testers are reporting their results. So how accurate are the COVID numbers being reported? Yeah, so I think the official COVID numbers have historically probably been under reporting, um, but that's a bias we've always been aware of um, with disease surveillance, with the introduction of home testing. I think that bias got more profound and a lot of the work we were doing was trying to help certain groups estimate what their actual case counts were when we included home testing cases that weren't reported elsewhere. Uh, so we did some of that work with the CDC. We did some of that work with Massachusetts Department of Health and some others. Um, but this is one of like at its core outbreaks near me is syndromic surveillance. And this is where um, reporting symptoms becomes really important because when we look at our COVID like illness and our influenza like illness, it's not an official case count, but if we're seeing a big jump up in people who are experiencing COVID symptoms, but they're not testing or they're not reporting it, we can infer like there is a lot of COVID probably circulating here are things that we, and we can sort of inform our partners who have a little bit more boots on the ground um, to amp up what they're doing to try and help get official numbers where they're supposed to be. Good stuff. And speaking of official numbers, to summarize some of Brent's other questions, where should people go if they, you know, want to stay up to date on, you know, best advice, best practices, current numbers, what's going on in their area? Yeah, so I would say your state health department probably has some form of a COVID dashboard um, that hopefully they're still maintaining. I know a lot of groups um, put a lot of resources towards these earlier in COVID and, and those resources have disappeared, but hopefully your state health department still has it. Um, the CDC COVID-19 data tracker is always a good tool as well. Um, you can look at some different things on there. We actually have another project that feeds into that, that looks sort of at the social implications of COVID. Um, and we also link out to some resources on our site for folks as well. That's awesome. And then um, uh, you may not know this one, this is kind of a big one because public health is so different in different places in the state. Uh, but what are public health officials currently doing to make, to address respiratory illnesses like COVID and flu? Yeah, I, I feel like there's a pivot that's happening sort of in some of the communication back to seasonal respiratory illness, um, which works until we have something that's not seasonal again. Um, I, I do not envy individuals who have to sort of make guidance for public health or communicate these things out. It's incredibly challenging. Um, there's always a balance between what you think really should be happening and what you think people will comply with. And if you go too far and then there's no compliance, um, that can really damage the perception of public health. And I think we might've seen a bit of that um, in COVID-19. So I do think sort of when a lot is circulating, focusing on that, focusing on testing before doing things, um, when you can, distancing, it's, it's really gonna be sort of back to self-managing risk um, for a bit, but as we all saw with COVID, when something big emerges, that usually changes um, again and how public health is approaching illnesses. And we have one more question from Brent. He wants to know, where is the best place to track new COVID variants in other countries? I'm, I'm probably the State Department, right? Or what do you think, Autumn? Yeah, I went, there's probably a dashboard somewhere on a, on a .gov that's looking um, at these. Um, there's probably some groups as well um, who have, I think there's a group out of Oxford that looks at G, like the genomic sequences of some of these. Um, so I would turn to some of the academic groups that sort of stood out earlier in the pandemic. Um, there's the group at Hopkins. I think there's a group at Oxford as well. Um, but I would honestly advise if you're really interested in variants of interest, it's probably um, groups outside the US who might have that data. We aren't doing as much strain testing in the US for COVID cases as other countries have uh, throughout the pandemic and probably are currently as well. So um, I would probably seek maybe some European um, 
government sites or um, academic groups there for that type of data. Good stuff. And another question from Brent. He wants to know, where's the best place to follow vaccine research results regarding COVID vaccines and side effects that were reported over time? Yeah, so the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice, all of their sort of findings and discussions um, get publicly disclosed. Granted, it's usually after the meeting happens, um, but they have sort of a good way of synthesizing what's happening. They're using that data to make guidelines. Um, so that is a page or a group I would recommend um, looking sort of at what they're looking at and discussing as a good indicator of um, sort of what research to be aware of. Fantastic. And then I have another fun question for you, Autumn. Mm -hmm. um, what part of this work excites you the most? Excites me the most. I am uh, very excited to get back to the roots of like consistent surveillance and reporting and research um, in a non-emergent situation. We'll see. Uh, there always seems to be something new um, coming out, but I think this sort of new turn of at home testing, um, more over the counter prescriptions, really enabling and empowering people to be caring for themselves, diagnosing themselves and doing what they need, virtual healthcare. Um, that's really exciting to me that we're sort of turning this page where people hopefully have less barriers to get the care they need. Uh, and hopefully that helps them, obviously with their own health, but sort of feeling uh, more empowered in the healthcare system we have. So I think um, combination of things, hopefully settling down on the research side and then sort of seeing how these new tools we have in healthcare sort of change people's relationship with the system. Fantastic. And we have another question from Brent. He wants to know, what is a day in the life of a public health worker like? Yeah, so I definitely depends on the day. Um, I would say I spend probably about half my time doing more research analysis activities, the other half doing programmatic um, management. We are a grant funded group. So with that comes, um, you know, preparing deliverables reports for our funders and our stakeholders about how our tools are performing, um, making sure things are working as they're supposed to, responding to users who have concerns, and then getting into the data, looking at what, what's happening. We have, um, well, I have data I look at weekly to sort of see trends like during flu season and then other research projects um, that are broader, um, looking at overall pattern. So uh, I would say the day in life of a public health worker has a lot of variety, uh, especially in my role. Um, and you're sort of doing a, a mix of applied public health research and uh, surveillance efforts. Awesome. I think you answered Brent's other question talking about different types of work. It seems like y'all do a little bit of everything in public health. Yes. Yeah. And one of the reasons I really like uh, my team and outbreaks near me in the computational epidemiology lab is I get sort of to do all those different um, pieces of public health. Um, there are individuals who like to focus in more on one thing. Um, so they might choose a role or uh, a location like a local health department or state health department where you're a little more specialized um, in what you're doing. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of variety in the field. Fantastic. And last chance for our attendees on Zoom or on Facebook to ask questions. Um, but I have one more question for you, Autumn. What's something you haven't told us yet that you think everyone should know about Outbreaks Near Me? I think Outbreaks Near Me is a really great way to feel like you are contributing sort of to this whole madness of COVID and infectious disease surveillance, but also, you know, I, I think people's relationship with public health and health agencies has probably changed a bit over the past few years. And Outbreaks Near Me is a tool where you can feel like you're getting direct data from someone who's sort of not affiliated under that, if that's something you're not as confident in as you used to be. We do work very closely with state and federal health departments, but at the end of the day, we're our own organization. People are reporting in how they feel. We're letting them know how people around them feel. And it's another tool you can have in deciding sort of how you want to approach your day or your week or your month when it comes to disease and sort of managing your own risk for infectious disease. Fantastic. I love it. Yeah. Giving people more resources, more power, always good. Um, well, I think that's it, Autumn. I'm so grateful that you came. I'm going to share my screen one more time. 
Just to remind everybody that April is indeed Citizen Science Month. There's no other be better way to celebrate Citizen Science Month than doing Citizen Science. And you all could do outbreaks near me right now. You could go to SciStarter.org forward slash NLM and you can click on the outbreaks near me icon, you know, keep track of your contributions near SciStarter dashboard and then start contributing. Um, we really, really hope that you do because um, your contributions do make a difference. So if you um, enjoyed today's event or you have constructive feedback for us or you just want to say hello, whatever it is, please fill out our survey. I'm going to go ahead and put the link in the chat as well. Uh, I'll do that in just a second, but it's up on the screen. Uh, it's links.asu.edu forward slash CSM dash participant dash survey dash 53. You can potentially win a free copy of the field guide to citizen science. And to be honest, response rates to the surveys have been low so far. So you have a really good chance of winning this book. So you might as well fill out the survey. Um, thank you again to the Network of the National Library of Medicine, the All of Us Research Program, and the Arizona State University for their support of Citizen Science Month. And most of all, thank you to Autumn for educating us today about Outbreak Near Me. Thanks to our interpreter uh, for interpreting today's event in Spanish, our captioners for captioning in Spanish and English, and if, um, for all of our attendees for caring about citizen science and wanting to make a difference. We really, really do appreciate you. Autumn, anything else to say to us before we go? My mouse disappeared. No, uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, feel free to email info at outbreaksnearme.org if you have any questions, and I hope you all participate. Yay, I'm putting that survey in the chat. I really want you all who are here to fill it out because you could win a book. Why not win a book, you know? Um, and give us some feedback. Tell us what you liked about today's event. Say, do Outbreaks Near me, me events every Citizen Science Month? I mean, yeah, we can hear what's up, hear what the latest and greatest of Outbreaks Near Me is. Um, but yeah, Autumn, thank you so, so much. Um, we'll we'll see you in flu season probably to do some yes. more events together. <laughs> yeah. All right. Bye, everybody. Good night. Thank you.